Um, since we're introduced so well, I want to start asking my questions. How are you guys? Great. I should say that. Very well. <laughs> well, we prepared some questions for you, and I want to kind of switch it off between you two so that we can be maybe uh, more powerful, you know? Let's start with Ms. Mutlu, first of all. We know that your first startup was an e-commerce website and where you sold unique designer finds. Um, can you tell us how that venture led to becoming a great bag designer? Yeah, with pleasure, thank you. Um, well, about 10, 11 years ago, I founded this e-commerce website where I was selling more than 100 designer brands. And um, at some point, I realized that I couldn't find any, the, right, the right bags to sell on the website. Mm -hmm. And I think, looking back now, that was a really sweet spot because um, I didn't really real realize the importance of that um, at the time. But basically, it was um, the decision was towards making um, beautiful, well-made handbags that are actually visually in the luxury segment, but the pricing is more contemporary and more accessible. So that's how I decided. And like two years later, I decided to close down the e-commerce business and solely focus on the bags. And today, um, we sell uh, in Turkey, obviously, but outside of Turkey, we sell at 25 retail points, including um, Bergdorf Goodman, Browns, Farfetch, et cetera, et cetera. Out of curiosity, I just want to ask you a little question. Do people, when buying, do people look at the prices and if the prices are high, oh, this is a good brand? Or what is the criteria here? Um, both, I think. Um, but I think Mehrimu is standing at a price point where you can, you, to buy a Mehrimu bag, you can actually save money and buy it. And then if you're more affluent, you can buy like tons of it. And that's where the sweet spot is, I think. Okay. Whereas with more luxury b bags, yeah. There is a barrier of entry, obviously. Exactly, exactly. Okay, when I turn to you, um, you were born in Scotland and lived there till the age of 27. Now you're currently living here in Istanbul and you're working here. So how did you like the transition from Scotland to Istanbul? It was very hard at first because I was actually um, born in a very, very little quiet village in Scotland. And I've always had a big dream of living in a big city. I moved from Scotland to London first, and London was still not enough. I still felt like I had a connection with Istanbul. Both my parents are Turkish, and the amount of Turkish that I could speak at home was just a, a little amount, and I just wanted to use this little amount of Turkish and my talent and go further with it in Turkey. And then I actually, first of all, just came for a holiday to test it out to see how it was, and then I never returned back, and I've been here for four years, and it's been an amazing transition. Like moving to any city, it was very, very hard at first. I did pack my suitcase up twice to go back to Scotland, but um, I stayed on, and it's definitely been worth staying for. Yeah, you, you told me when we were, uh, before we got here, you were like, I was supposed to go back, but for six months you were going to stay here yeah. on vacation and take your time here, then you didn't get back to Scotland. No, because um, the weather in Scotland is not very nice. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> like the main weather reason. today, usually, like 300 days out of the year, it's always raining, but I do prefer it sunny. And I guess in Turkey, I feel like, especially Istanbul, there's, people would say this and I would never believe them. They would say that Istanbul's got this magic feeling where when, once you're in it, you can't leave it. And it's exactly like that. Even when I go back home to visit my parents to Scotland, like a week later, I'm so bored. I feel like I miss Istanbul. So like, I'm definitely really in my happy place. Okay, perfect. We love Istanbul too. <laughs> so was making Mirimu an international brand, was a strategic movement or it just happened organically? Uh, well, it, it, I think the two go hand in hand. Um, there was definitely the strategy or the wish of, or the dream of expanding globally, but it had to be, um, you know, there had to come a point where I would be able to say, yes, this is it, and go for it. Mm -hmm. Because um, positioning-wise, Mehrimu needed to stand with um, other fellow designers. It can't just, we couldn't just sell it anywhere. You can't sell anywhere in the world and call it international. So, you know, it had to sit in the right places. Right. And then there was a spark and it took off from there. And that journey, because it's a startup, because it's an entrepreneurial venture, was obviously a little bit um, organic. It had to be because of like limited budgets, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what about you here? How did you manage to capture local followers' attention um, on social media in Turkey after coming back here? It, it happened in a short time. So like, I'm thinking about me, like I'm going to a country that I'd never lived before and capturing their attention and their followings is not easy. How did you do that? 
I mean, before I came to Turkey, I was on about 10,000 followers. I was using Instagram quite actively. It wasn't actually very popular in Turkey at that time when I came. I had opened up my um, Instagram page back in the UK. And then I just thought, you know, this is something different. And not a lot of people are posting makeup in Turkey on Instagram four years ago. This just kind of blew up over a recent time. And then I was still, you know, doing my selfies, doing my makeup, posting um, pictures and giving kind of details of how I did my makeup. And then once with my position within MAC and then our Instagram local handle for MAC Cosmetics Turkey opened up, I was so excited because I was able to um, lead the team in developing Instagram from there as well. But what it takes, it definitely took a lot of dedicated time and building good connections. I believe that these two are the most key important things that I've done to build up my following is because by building good connections with either celebrities that I do makeup with or influencers that I work with, once you have a good connection with them, they will want to call you back, they will want to do more projects with you. And also, I dedicated a lot of time at first. Um, I was one of the first few people in Turkey to do live makeup tutorials and I did this almost like a TV series. So I would do it like every Thursday at seven o'clock and it was just dedicated time and people would tune in almost as if they were watching a TV program. And this brought my following up to over 60,000 more. And it's just dedicating a lot of time and building good connections is definitely the way forward because it's a completely different job, social media. Definitely, definitely. It takes a lot of time. Yeah. Definitely. If you dedicate some uh, certain times, like TV shows, that's definitely the toughest part, probably. Yeah. Over the nine years, Mer Merimu has been around. It's been almost nine years, right? Um, you've designed some iconic and much copied bags, like Res Bag, Faye Box, Merimu, Initials are just a few of those styles. And it seems that Merimu appeals to fashion lovers, but also um, it is also very timeless and the styles can be classics and for many years like can you tell us the secret of that? Well, the secret to that is, is, is that it's actually the formula to <laughs> what I'm doing. Um, when I design a collection, I start with a mood board and then um, I run it through many, many filters and um, the filters that they go through are all the people that I want Mary Mu to appeal to, you know, I want it to, Mary Mu always has a very nostalgic, feminine, um, chic, sophisticated vibe, but I don't want it to be very up, like outdated, I want it to be to the point, contemporary, right. so, and also, as we discussed before, it's a, at a very good price point, so that also makes it even more accessible to more people. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, you're working, I'm going back to Alev now, you're working at a very high pace, and how do you find time? How do you find time for social media since it's also a lot of dedication? Yeah. Well, I work five days at Mac and I work two days freelance Saturday and Sunday. So I do actually work seven days a week at the moment. I don't know how I'm going to keep this tempo up for how long. But what I do find with Instagram and the most interaction that I get is I take people on this journey with me. I mean, every day I get messages from lots of people saying, I want to be a makeup artist, I want to work as much as you work, I want to go places where you go. And I think it's, this is the reason why I'm, my followers are so like, kind of like my family as well, because they almost kind of come with me everywhere. So like I include them in my backstage setups, I include them in the journey of the makeup, how it's done, and then maybe after how I'm cleaning my brushes and then maybe meeting new celebrities or new influencers, I take them on that journey. And I think that's what's most liked about my Instagram page is that I I take them everywhere with me mm -hmm. and I include it into my everyday life. Everyday life, yeah. Every day, when you, after you say everyday life, I'm going back to you because this is kind of related to it. You created contents for Merimu on your own for the, oh, I've dropped my phone, sorry. Uh, you created content of Merimu's Instagram by yourself yeah. and there are so many anecdotes and a lot of storytelling in it instead of just the glossy photos of the products. Mm -hmm. um, is this a strategic decision or just happened by itself? Well, it's the only way I know how to do it. I mean, I couldn't... Mary Moo is a brand that's, um, that has sold. I mean, obviously, we're, an, we're a commercial product. We sell something. Um, but I don't want the product and the brand to be a consumerism-driven brand. We're not very philanthropic, but we do have soul, and we want, um, we want Mary Moo to be more than just the bags. So, right. um, and to represent a lifestyle. And um, just as Alev said, it's very true. I, I feel like I have a very organic following, and only the people who care about what Mary Moo stands for, or that care about the bags and the, tra the trips that I go on, you know, the, the values that I have, it's all a part of the big picture. So that's why I cannot ever make it really like a glossy, um, like a magazine, uh, 
kind of uh, yeah, yeah. right yeah because like yeah. I asked that question because sometimes brands take grab attention from their backstage stories like what happened how did it produce you know those kind of stories kind of get people's attention so I think it plays a big role mm -hmm. in branding um, what is the most pr proud moment of your career till now I guess there's there's been a few but I feel really proud when somebody books me, when, every time I'm booked, to be honest, because now there's so many makeup artists, especially because of Instagram world as well, either professional or not professional, as if they do as a hobby. Every time I get booked, I feel really proud, especially when they say, I love your style of makeup, because I think in somebody owning their own style, so my style is more of a kind of glamorous style to makeup, and I think when people ask me and they choose me for my style, that makes me feel really proud that I've got that kind of set. And also, I guess, um, like eight years ago when I was at home watching X Factor or this um, The Voice, mm -hmm. and I would always say to my mom, I would have a connection with um, Hardise, if you know, she's a very lovely lady and a beautiful singer as well. And um, I said to my mom eight years ago, maybe even older than that, I said, I really want to do Hardis's makeup, mom, and I'm going to do it. And I'm really lucky now that I'm actually doing Hardis's makeup for um, the voice as well. And my mom's really proud as well, which makes me really happy. Yeah, you sent that energy up in the sky and it happened. Yeah. That's a good, good thing. Congrats. Yeah. And I have one more question to each of you. Um, people like Olivia Palermo, Eva Chen, Princess Beatrice, and many other p important people around the world use, use your bags, actually. And the brand is growing slowly but surely. So how do you link the success of your business to influencer marketing? Well, it's great that, you know, all these wonderful people are using Mary Mo, um, but I always feel like my job is to make bags, mm -hmm. to make them the best that they can be, to tell their stories, to speak to my customers, to my end users first. Once I do that, I put it out. So I think a lot of new brands, young designers, fall in the trap of influencer marketing by saying, I'm going to make this bag, I'm going to put it up on Instagram, I'm going to send it to influencers, get X amount of likes, X amount of following, and then that's not how you do the business. That's not how you actually sell the bag. So the, I do it in reverse. So I put it out there and then the influencers come to the rescue. And we build a very, like Alev said, we're, with the influencers as well, not just with the followers, we have a very supportive um, relationship. And I think that the brands and the influencer need to fit each other like a glove. Not every influencer is right for a brand and not every brand is right for an influencer. I, I think that they just need to live and breathe the product. I don't even care if they post. It's more important for me that they actually wear it, love it, because that's another influence um, radius, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, to wrap it up, um, we, I mean, it's the cherry on the, it's the cherry on the cake, mm -hmm. um, but the product comes first. The product comes yeah. first, then you work with the influencer and the advertisement part. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. How do you see the future of beauty and makeup? Um, I guess the future is very hard to tell in this world because everything is changing so fast. But what I do see is that because there's so many influencers now and it's like almost like a hobby as well. It's a part of our life. I think it's to be real um, for never to um, show off something that's not your style. And maybe a lot of um, you know, c companies approach you saying, can you please use my product? Can you please share this? And I think it's really choosing things that are really suited to your style and products that you believe in. Uh, this isn't anything. So if you're in fashion, you, know, you would only wear the clothing that you really feel proud of and that you would really offer to somebody else as well. And I also see that um, the future is really like bright with this influencing and beauty and guru because as we heard before, that celebrities now um, are not as preferred, influencers are preferred more, especially in the big brand that I work for. I mean, Mac, before, like three years ago, they would never approach influencers. It would always be celebrity-based. Now, our, fu our future projects are all influencer-based, and this is because it's more real, it's real life, so people want to hear and see what you are using in your own real life. So I think the future is really bright for beauty gurus and makeup artists, if they're real and they keep to their own style. Okay, thank you too so much. Yeah. These are my questions. I don't know if you have any additional sayings. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.